Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Alaska to College Game presentation. I'm Tim Davis. I coach over at West High School, and I've been part of the Coaches Association for some time now. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us on a, on a weeknight. Real quick, I'd recommend even grabbing a cell phone and QR coding that so you can actually follow along with us. So, if I skip a, a slide or something... You guys uh, can still access the slide even if I move on. I do not know everything. I just know what I know. And there are some men on this Zoom that have logged in and some, some moms that have logged in that probably know more and have gone through the experience and lived experiences is, is essential. Um, so I really want to thank a bunch of people who uh, put this slideshow together. First of all, disclaimer recruiting and finding a college home is a battle between uh, the head and the heart because the it has to be a, a, a venture that we take on where we are informed and we have good data and good information. Man, that heart tugs at you. You all want to be division one and we all want to see our kids go to division one. This is for players, coaches, and parents. We want to, we want to have our, our kids. We want to be proud of our kids going off and and playing at the highest possible level and yet the decisions we're about to make are going to be financially uh very very important they're going to be weighty and we have to use our mind on this and some some of the stuff that we have really good coaches on here that have spent time uh giving some really good information sometimes they say things that are unpopular but necessary truth it's because of love that they're saying this and I just want to preface, I just made this slide right before we started because I thought it was so important that we balance that head versus the heart when it comes to making this tough decision. So real quick, I want to introduce the people you're going to see throughout the night. All, all these coaches have played collegiate athletics, participated in them. They have been head coaches and they have seen their sons go through this process. So when you see these guys pop up on session tonight, know that they have a lot of information and a wealth uh, uh, of really, really good stuff uh, to deliver to you guys. So first of all, we have Mike Collett at North Pole. We have Galen Brantley, uh, who has been wildly successful for years and years down in the peninsula. And we have Walter Harmon, a, a state championship coach uh, who – one, one with his son, you know, and that's, that's a special thing um, for those guys to go through. So, uh, and all these guys have either landed their kids at schools or are currently going through that process right now. So a big thanks to those guys. And I know a few of them hopped on. Let's talk about what we're actually trying to get done tonight. Number one goal of tonight is successful recruitment. And what is successful recruitment? Successful recruitment is where you find the right fit, where you complete a degree, and you influence the next 40 years of your life. And this is speaking to the athlete. That is what successful recruitment is. It isn't necessarily land a D1 offer. It's not necessarily go just the only place that you think is available. It is finding the fit, the degree, and the 40-year influence that you're going to have. Um, so let's talk about that really quick. Fit. As you're evaluating colleges, things to think about. Geography. Could you live there? Um, could you live in the location of the school? Let's uh, the distance from home or loved ones, the isolation that it can be, especially for a college freshman, can be uh, can be difficult. And it's something to consider as you're evaluating if the school is the right fit for you. One thing we're going to go over a lot tonight: who is buying your food? Who is buying your lunch? That's going to be a, a very important question, as you can imagine. Uh, Football is not going to be easy. No matter where you go, it's going to be a theme here. It's not easy. It does It's very important, and it's super worth it, and it's awesome, but it's not easy. So if you go to a place that's, a, that's not a right fit, when football gets hard, it's easy to walk away from that situation. Lastly, trust. And this is for all the people involved, parents, players, coaches. Do we trust the collegiate uh, coaches and staff? Have we built the relationship? Do they trust you? This trust is wildly important. So fit, that's the, the first part of successful recruitment. Second is your degree. The goal is to obtain a, uh, a college degree with the sport of football in tow. So the question is, what do they offer? What type of degree program does the school that you're looking for offer? Um, this is incredibly important because when the school wants you to come play for them, that's a business decision for that school. You, you are an asset 
for that school. So the school needs to be an asset for you. And it's time to start thinking about what that program has that can help you in life. If there was no football, would you still go to school there and get a degree? It doesn't mean that you would. It doesn't mean like if football went away, you, you, you're at that school forever. But what it does mean or does ask is if there was no football, could you see yourself graduating from that school and getting a degree? And we've actually had that uh, in our program from our experience. So it's, it's a really interesting deal. Uh, we'll talk about that here in moments, but that degree is huge. Uh, lo- along with the degrees, how well does the college land their graduates? So this is something to, this is, this is beyond just the sport of football. Now we're now thinking about these life decisions. Uh, the mind has to enter into this. Um, does the school land graduates into professions or are you going to just be used for your time at the school and your university um, or do they develop you as a young man um, in the pro, in the sport of football? Uh, the next deal is the 40-year aspect. This is the big one. This one takes m- – many high schoolers aren't here yet. Um, but if what I would encourage is if you're on your, this call, now is the time to start thinking about your calling that is beyond um, the sport of football. What, what drives you? What potential professions interest you? And this will all help lead to this. You're not making a four-year decision. You're not making a one semester decision. You're making a decision that will influence the next 40 years of your life. And fundamentally, a degree is going to open doors. So a degree can be wildly important in today's, today's world, today's market. Um, but a fit degree 40. That's really the equation for a successful recruitment. So let's get into all that. So how does a successful recruitment, I want to give some analogies here, as much information as we're going to give. I think there's some conceptual things that we all have to get on the table uh, to be successful in our recruitment. It's like building a table. The first part starts with the athlete. Athletes got to own this. Um, the first leg of the table, if you will, the athlete has to own their process. They have to be, um, committed to the books. They have to be committed um, to the huddle film, to the Twitter, to the all the things we know about, right? That's an important aspect. The second is the parents. Parents have to be walking that journey with them. Uh, we'll get into each person's role as we go through this. The high school staff, that's the coaches and that's the counseling staff. It usually also could be admin and teachers of the high school. And lastly, it's the college. If the college doesn't have an interest in you, it can make recruiting difficult right from the top. It can make it very, very hard. So you want to find places. This is kind of assuming the colleges have shown interest at this point. Uh, when it comes to interest, we'll get to that as well. Successful recruitment can survive if one of these four legs goes away. Um, maybe parents can't be involved for various reasons. Maybe maybe the high school staff um, isn't involved for some reason. Recruiting can kind of survive on, on three of the legs. Uh, high school staff and an athlete and the college working together can make it happen. The athlete and the parents um, and, the, and the college can make it happen. It, a table can stand. It's going to be wobbly. The chances of holding up that successful recruitment can be difficult, but but it is still possible. If two legs go, we're in dire trouble. Realistically, at the end, and, and, and recruitment probably won't be successful. We won't find the forty-year influence, the degree at the end, um, and even the the immediate fit in the place. So, we're looking for all four coordinating with each other to successfully land our students in the best place possible for that. So let's go through each role tonight. First of all, is the student athlete's role. And as we do that, the number one thing we're going to talk about right off the top is the core GPA. And this is something that I, I myself have been have, have failed at as a, as a coach at times, understanding the difference between core GPA, NCAA core GPA, and GPA. Not all high school courses count as NCAA core courses. English, math, science, foreign languages, comparative religions or philosophies are usually those core courses. I would tell you, you really need to be visiting with your counselor from your earlier than your junior year, but junior year at the latest on talking about these classes and calculating your core GPA. Uh, Classes for credit recovery, such as APEX, don't carry any weight with the NCAA and don't count. At the end of the day, to play Division I football, you need a 2.3 GPA and 16 core courses. D2 is 2.2. If you want help calculating that, this right down here is actually a link that you can click and 
go to the GPA calculator and can see how those classes play out. It's um, a certain amount of years of English, certain amount of math, and you can calculate all that. That's a really good counselor thing to do. Uh, and is, is a Zoom call in and of itself, just talking about that. Right now, the NCAA does not have a sliding scale um, for at least one more year. However, based on SAT, ACT, however, many, many more schools are requiring the SAT, ACT. And we're going to we're going to proceed tonight with the with the um, statement that you need to take the standardized tests. You need to open as many doors as possible. And opening doors really means that if you are in Alaska, you have to differentiate yourself. And your core GPA should be as close to 3.0 as possible. Some of you are, are probably beyond that, maybe. You're a senior. You just finished your season, and that's not you. There are options. But understand that the doors close anything below 3.0 you get. Some things, uh, uh, some schools would even say 3.5. But I would say that a 3.0 GPA is a balanced GPA that's attainable, that shows that shows that the student is dedicated to it. And most colleges are, are looking at that number and they're going to make some decisions based on that. So I always say 3.0, if you want to be a competitive athlete out of the state of Alaska to really differentiate who you are. Uh, before we get too deep into the checklist, I want players to kind of have a understanding of what they're getting into and, and maybe even some words from uh, wise people that have gone before us and, and have done this. And this is Louis Famasino, one of, one of my very, uh, you know, I coached him and he's one of the people I look up to a great deal. His path was JC to division one FBS. He's earned his degree from New Mexico state. Um, he, he went through Idaho, LA Harbor, and then New Mexico state. And we'll get into a little bit more about his journey, but this is his words that he wanted us to have. Time management is everything. Think of your time as money. Spend it and invest it wisely. You can have fun, but that keep that same energy when it's time to put in work. Have unwavering faith and grit. I was never the best athlete to come through us, but I had the most grit, and that's what helped me push to meet all my goals. Grit and time management will be things we hear talk about throughout the night. Another player that uh, I had the fortune to, to work with was Sean Duffy. Uh, JC at uh, San Francisco City College went on to Dubuque University and earned a degree there after a successful playing career. And this is just a great heads up just to start the night off of like, hey, guys, this is what to kind of expect. Don't be naive at all wherever you go. Know that you're going to have to work extra hard and nothing will be given to you. Don't think you're going to have one practice and automatically have a starting spot. Sean was a backup at JC. He only had a few reps. Uh, but his film from high school and his reps that he did have at San Francisco City uh, earned him an opportunity to go to Dubuque. And we'll talk about what those opportunities mean at each level. Quick AK fact check. Uh, Alaska gets hated on, you know, as we know, uh, uh, you could say hated on. I don't want to sound defensive. Um, it has its advantages. And one of the biggest advantages is playing time. In Alaska, you can get potentially both sides of the ball, lots of film. Um, and here's the big one. When you guys go to camps, uh, Sean was, was the oddity when he went to camps. Louis was the oddity. These were weird dudes that showed up to these camps. Well, Alaska, a lot of times these coaches and will will call you Alaska. They'll refer to you as Alaska. So here's a, here's a pro tip. If you go to a, a go to a camp, especially if it's not a team camp, go to Fred Meyer or cars, buy an Alaska bumper sticker or something, not a big one, but throw it on your helmet. Regardless of what school you go to find an Alaska sticker that, that matches maybe your school color scheme and market Alaska in that sense. It's a, uh, you'll gain attention and then your play will have an opportunity. Again, it's all about differentiating ourselves um, to be successful. Here's another quick fact though. The population of Alaska is just under 750,000. Whereas the population of the Seattle metro area is 4 million people. We're a suburb of Seattle in a sense. The difference being is we have a state. You can use the word state championship, uh, all state. Um, this is an advantage to us. It is also a disadvantage in ways. We'll talk about that as we go on. But I want us to put this all in our mind, um, both the pros and the cons of, of coming from a, a small town environment, even if in Anchorage. But it's a, a state and, and how we can use that as marketers of ourselves. So our first video tonight uh, with the coaches um, on the panel, again, it's Mike Hollett from North Pole, Walt Harmon from South, formerly of South, and uh, Galen Brantley at Sohi talking about how to differentiate yourself in the state of Alaska.
the the biggest thing that I had to really do, and I had embarked on this path years prior to, was really get current on what collegiate coaches wanted to see. You know, how are they going to pay attention to our kids in Alaska? And and what were the things that Jackson needed to do to check the boxes to get the attention of folks that would say, hey, I want to throw some money at your education and want you to come play football for us and, you know, on and on and on. So th- those were some things that I had to to take on. And it was a sobering journey. Uh, things aren't as uh, straightforward as one would think, you know, because every kid can run, jump and catch. That's that's table stakes. Right. So what differentiates them from other kids? The GPA, uh, it just opens up so many doors for kids. You know, the number of opportunities you'll have with a, a 2.5 versus a kid with a 3.5, it's three times as many opportunities, you know. Um, and so, you know, it, that gets in the way sometimes with kids not being able to get go where they want to go. OK, and so the classroom first and foremost. And plus, you want to be successful when you get there. I'm not you know, I mean, the, they don't want to bet on a kid with a 2.5 because it shows you're lazy. You know, they want to they want to bet on a kid that even if it takes them a little while, he's going to be OK. Um, you know, and you're, and you're, you're there to get a degree. And so, um, you know, I think that's, that's the big one. He's got to take care of business in the classroom. Kids, sometimes they all think they're D1 and don't realize that there's really, really good ball at division two, NAI, D3. Every kid at a, at an upper level NAI program is all state somewhere. Every single kid was all state somewhere. And so I think you got to get past that right away and, and understand it's still really, really good football and a great experience. The best thing for kids, if your team's going to a camp, go with your team. So if your coach is planning on taking a trip to a camp somewhere, go with them, right? That means your coach has done the research. They know it's a good camp. You're going to get valuable information out of it. You're going to get valuable coaching out of it. If you're wanting to go on your own to a camp, um, make sure you do your research and talk to your coach. You know, like, what do you think? Because there's a lot of... Uh, what I'll, what I'll, I don't know, like underwear camps or whatever out there. There's a lot of scams out there for kids. Um, they're just trying to make 60 bucks a pop and, you know, not really worried about evaluating talent or anything like that. Um, you know, big things for me, I want to be able to put pads on. I want to be there a couple of days. Uh, I want to hit, you know, I want it to be like, I want it to be football. Um, whether that's local or out of state, you know, finding a place that you want to go and trying to get in front of those coaches, I think is really important for our interior athletes. All right. So, uh, let's dive into the checklist and then I'll take some time to take a look at, at, at questions. We, we pop up in the chat after we get through the checklist. Um, one of the main things to do is really this call is designed for juniors starting at the end of their junior season. Um, and so as we do that, every junior, if you have not done so already should be meeting with their counsel counselor like this week or maybe even earlier than that. But if you have not done so, and if you're not, if you're a senior and you haven't done it, do it now, like do it now, meet with your counselor at school. Your counselor is really the, almost like the uh, gatekeeper and the person who is able to uh, help you make sure that you have dotted all the I's and, and cross the T's that are required. So make sure you do a core GPA check with them and a required class check. Next thing to check off on your list and meet with your head coach. Find out what your head coach um, thinks about your huddle film and head coaches. We have to, this is where the head and the heart, right? We want to tell every kid how great they are and how amazing they are. And it's true. Our kids are great and amazing, but how important is it to be honest with our kids? Uh, that, that can be difficult. So, so that is an important factor for both player and uh, coach to consider um, that head and the heart uh, side of the house. Um PSATs. Take those now as soon as possible. Take a PSAT in the fall and then take your SAT, ACT in the spring. Again, not required by the eligibility center, but it, because of the sliding scale is gone. Um, but it will be back. And many schools are still looking at SATs, ACT. So it while it's it, last year it was about 50% of the NCAA required SAT, ACT. Um, I would take them both. And I would take them as many times as it takes to, to get the score you want. Your eligibility center should be completed in the spring. We'll have a link to that coming up. That's the end. Both NCAA and NAIA level we'll talk about tonight have those um, 
eligibility centers and then make a camp plan and let your head coach know what your camp plan is. Um, it's really, as you heard everybody say in the differentiating yourself, you got to get outside of the state and go to camps. There are some great camps up here, everything from all Alaska to team camps to coach Shackelford's lineman camp over at East, um, all phenomenal camps with college eyes on you. Those are all things to get to. Um, one note I put was plan trips to avoid camp overload. We've seen this with a few of our athletes who've gone and done every single camp and gone on a whirlwind whirlwind tour. It that can wear down on an athlete. So parents, this is a, a one of your roles, you know, really be closely monitoring your athletes if they are going on these camps all over the United States and making sure they're not running down. We almost every year we've had a kid go out and do, let's say if they do more than four camps, let's say they do more than four camps especially in a month. They almost always get sick when they come back. And there's travel and there's stuff going on. You're just run down. And it's really hard to re-engage and be the best player you want to be for your teammates and stuff. So it's really important to strategize these. In these camps, begin the college relationships. Begin the conversations. Make sure you know the coaches' names and make sure that they know your names the best you can. Um, this recruiting thing, head in the heart, it's it's a relationship. It really is. And you're building relationships with these college uh, colleges that want you to come play for them uh, and you want to go to, but you have to, the, you can't just show up and say, look at my film. You, it's, it's a relationship that really starts in earnest your junior year. So after your junior year, starting at the beginning of your senior season and actually through your senior season, you should be updating your huddle. Um, I would recommend what we've seen is dropping a mid-season reel. Um, many of the athletes around the state did that, like your first four games, and then update that thing at the end. It's not necessarily, it's not necessary to update that thing weekly and keep posting it and posting it. It is necessary to stay up on your huddle film that your coaches are posting. Click the star, click the star, get that stuff out of the way. So as soon as the season ends, you pick your film and we'll talk about that in a few moments hit publish and that thing's out and coaches get to see that. Don't, don't wait three weeks after the season to start clicking the stars on your highlights. And that really goes for juniors as well. Meet again with the school counselor. If you're doing the checklist seniors, you should meet with your counselor. Now core GPA and required class. We have had athletes show up to campus, register, be accepted, go to practice, be on the team, be ready to start and find out that they were a core GPA credit short. And they were not allowed, they were not an academic qualifier for that season. Um, still had their scholarship, still had all the, the things that went along with that. But that you can imagine that would be pretty heartbreaking. So that goes to all of us holding the table up. The college needs to check that, the counselor checks that, the parents check that, uh, the high school staff, coaches, and then the player checks that as well. All of us have to take our ownership uh, to successfully land our athletes. Meet with your heads, head coach. Uh, that includes that huddle evaluation again um, and social media evaluation. Have your head coach audit your Twitter. When you like something, like maybe somebody not wearing a lot of clothes, like maybe somebody saying pretty bad words, okay? Coaches see that. You know, when, I, when, when you buy a house or a car, you have to have credit built up and they check your credit score. Twitter, a professional Twitter is like your credit. It's kind of like a background check. They're going to check and see what you uh, have done to uh, where you're at in your, your credit, if you will. So the likes that you'd put out there, people can see, not even posting it. So put that in your mind. FAFSA, uh, for most seniors, you're going to be applying for federal student aid. You can do that as early as 10-1 of your senior year. SAT and ACT, you should be in your second attempt of that in the fall, and maybe even the third attempt as, as time goes on. Ideally, you know, I, I would recommend PSAT, SAT the first time, and evaluate your score. Is a second time necessary? It might be. And then that marketing yourself. We're going to do, we're going to talk about marketing in a moment. Um, consistent communication should now be picking up. Your senior year, you should be texting, DMing, and emailing schools that you know, and really want to go to, and then cast a wide net. We'll get into that some more as well. Um, and finally, the campus visit plan should begin. Um, you might've gone on an unofficial as a junior and done some other things. 
plan those camp campus visits. Um, and, and if possible, get on campus. It goes back to the fit. How do you know you're going to like the place if you've never visited the environment? It, ah, man, what a crucial thing. You got to live there. You got to live there for anywhere from four to five to six years. Uh, so you want to see the place. Okay, you've made your decision. You've checked all the boxes. You've gotten the offer. You've taken the offer. Now what? Continue to play sports. Go play soccer. Go run track. Go shoot hoops. Continue to play sports. Continue to train. Lift with your team. Lift with your past teammates. You know, most coaches I know will allow that. Um, lift. Lift and train. On 4-1, once you've done everything, you will be requesting final approval of the NCAA. That's you and your counselor in that final week. And I would actually, this says final week, I would say everything beyond signing day, which is that first Wednesday in February, everything beyond signing day, you should be meeting with your counselor pretty often. These, uh, if you downloaded the, the deal, you have links right here to the eligibility centers. If you haven't downloaded this presentation, there'll be another link coming up at the end of it. Um, but if you click on these links, it'll take you right to those eligibility centers. Another AK fact check time. Again, camps are the single most important way to begin your recruitment. Um, uh, that's been by far, again, whether it's all Alaska, team camp, whatever, if when you're choosing this school to go to, when you're making this 40 year decision, it begins that sophomore junior year of attending these camps and getting to know these coaches. Here's some thoughts on film and social media. Well, I think a, a couple things. One is when it comes to the film, uh, it's got to be front loaded. It's got you got to put the best stuff in the front, the stuff that's going to catch uh, coaches eyes. Uh, whether it was my own son or any other player, I think that's that's first and foremost. Um, I think. The other thing that we do, too, is, is you know, we don't sit around and wait for, you know, opportunities. We 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 figure out who who our kids are interested, you know, where they can see themselves playing. And then we send film directly to those people. We we make we reach out and make contact. I've got a couple of, of uh, friends that are college coaches and they hate getting emails uh, from these recruiting companies that inundates their emails. They're flooded. They want the kids to directly contact them or the high school coaches to directly contact them. And that's what really starts the conversation. So, you know, my counsel to all the kids right now, polish up your huddle film. You try to publish that anywhere and everywhere so people can see it. That's your casting a wide net approach. And then the parallel approach is the more laser focused I had a chance to, whether it was, you know, Randy Klingemeyer's All Alaska Camp, uh, and I met some coaches there, and I, I got all their cards, and I'm going to follow up with those guys, right? And I'm going to send this directly to them. Or perhaps a good friend of mine or a good friend of my head coach is, has followers on Twitter that are coaching outside and definitely looking at kids. So I'm going to refollow those guys and make sure I share my content with them as well. Your, your first five plays are your best football plays that you have as a kid you really have to get good at manipulating your huddle film because one coach is going to see you as an offensive player another coach is going to see you as your defensive player and the faster you can recreate that film to highlight the things that they either have questions about or they think they see you as or that they want to see more of the better you will become uh the question they had about jackson's like hey you know it, we like tough guys, right? I mean, we're Montana. We have Cowboys. I don't know. Are you tough? And, you know, I'm not seeing it in your film. I see a good athlete. I see a guy who played quarterback. I see a guy who played a little bit of safety, but are you tough? And literally before they hung up off, the, off that call, Jackson had recreated a film for Coach Robertson that highlighted all of his aggressive plays, all of his tough guy plays, all this stuff. And so that was one of the things that coach was really imp uh, impressed about. And he was able to take that to coach Choate and others. Clean up your Twitter. Um, make sure that your film's good to go, right? You got it. You got it set up. There's no slow motion in there or anything. Um, uh, make sure you've got, um, you know, a good email address, a good phone number for them. Your, your DMs are open on Twitter. Um, you're looking at those colleges that you're considering we have some slides that go along with the thoughts on film this one's been floating around twitter i've saved it and i try to send this off to athletes whenever possible this is an awesome awesome template to use when setting up your twitter i would recommend a twitter if you if you really uh have the need for a twitter that's going to be 
wildly different than your professional Twitter, I'd have a professional Twitter. So let's start with how that happens. First of all, use your real name. Get a profile pic in your uniform. Um, have you know? Maybe it could be this the photo day picture as well, but in your uniform. Make sure you're able to receive direct messages. Have that turned on. That you know, hey, this presentation's for 2022. Maybe in 2024, Twitter is not the main medium, but I would say Twitter is probably one of the main, if not the main medium that college coaches are uh, taking a look at and, and communicating with athletes. Have a professional handle, okay? Not, well, you you can imagine unprofessional handles, but have a professional handle with your name on it. Have the link to your huddle film. We're going to talk about huddle. We're going to talk about the wide net huddle. And that's what you want. The big, the, the top 10 plays. That is the huddle that you'd put in your profile. Uh, have your current town as your location. Don't put a silly location like Antarctica or something like that. Um, and then bio should have your high school. Spell it all out. Midfield, West Anchorage, South Anchorage, whatever it happens to be. Your GPA. Okay. It should have your SAT as well. Um, but highlight those good things. Put your class, your position, other sports you play, height, weight. I, it says limit the use of emojis in bio. I mean, I'd almost not use emojis in bio for this one, I would say, but have a little personality. Probably is not the worst thing as long as it's professional and works. And then if you have any type of rankings or stars or those type of things, uh, you could include that. Um, when you like something, you're telling the world that you endorse that, which colleges and coaches can see, be careful what you like. It's in a red box. This is a brilliant little slide. Parents have this on lock. Uh, students have this coaches have this. be ready to send this out. Um, and again, this whole slide show you guys can download and see. This is an actual DM. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is a DM from a athlete. This was going around on Twitter. Uh, and, and I'm assuming it's real. It looked real, but if it's not, it's certainly awesome. Uh, in this instance, a, a player, a, pr a prospect DMs a collegiate coach and says, sup coach. And then the, the coach follows with uh, Hey, cause you're young. I'm going to show you how they do this, man. And he gives him a, a template. Hello coach. My name is blank. I play the position here. Graduation year, school name city. I don't know if you should copy and paste this necessarily. Cause this is now a very famous tweet that's gone out there. And a lot of athletes probably are. But the basic idea is here, name, position, grad your school name, city, make sure everything is spelled correctly. Everything is accurate. Height, weight is not the extra inch that you have in the, the team program and not the extra five pounds it is what you weigh and are measured at right now tonight. Um, have your coach's name and contact, have your contact and have your link to your most up-to-date huddle film. And again, these huddle films are going to be somewhat living documents. Let's get into them now. So on huddle, you should have a title slide and that title slide should have your name, position, number, the vitals, your height, weight, and then major awards. Not a lot of information. I would even say because Twitter is probably the medium in which you're sharing the huddle film, you can have less in the way of contact stuff, but it's still good to put like a number on there if possible, a phone number. Your first film should cast a wide net. This is you just finished your season. All of us out here should have a top 10 football plays. Here's a secret that most college coaches tell us every year. They watch the first three to five plays. They might get to play 10. They're definitely not watching after a minute to a minute and a half. They're going to have hundreds, thousands of uh, these to go through. And so your first play, first three plays, first five plays are your best football plays. Offense, defense, special teams, doesn't matter. If you look like a dude, that's the plays to put in. Now, Two-way players should think about making additional and expanded one-sided films, especially if you're going to market yourself more as a linebacker, yet you've played some wide receiver. You should have a linebacker film as well, ready to go, because you need to be flexible. Just like Coach Harmon said uh, with his experience with Jackson, Coach Robertson wanted a little bit more physicality. Well, Jackson had the film chopped up, edited, ready to go, another film. Okay, just make another one sent to Coach Robertson at that moment. So like, hey, we love your film. You have a great arm. We'd like to see more throws on the run. Boom. You should be like, find all your mobile throws if you're a quarterback. Things to avoid. Avoid the long animations. Avoid the circles, lightning bolts, and arrows. You need those to identify where you're at. A lot of times, especially if you're a lineman or a box player, 
you're going to find that you're going to be near a bunch of chaos. You might need one of those identifiers, but avoid the long animations of those as quick as possible. Circle up, circle gone. Music with words. Should you edit outside of huddle and use your own words? Do not put music with words. It can most college coaches turn the music off. And the ones that do listen to music are listening to see what the music you put on. And if you have a bunch of stuff that's like, that's some profanity, has some stuff that doesn't want, would their university establishment would not want represented, that only turns them off. No slow motion at all. They want to see your most important asset in the game of football, and that's explosion. So have the explosion. No cheap plays, blindside blocks, penalties, or doing the same thing over and over again. Okay. There are some times it's good to show some stuff over and over a few repetitions, but especially, um, yeah, it's, it, it really got to be careful with repetition. You only have five clips, I would say before the colleges are turned off things to include show the full variety of your skills. If you're an O lineman, you should show, uh, outside zone blocking. If possible, you should show inside zone. You should show pass pro screen game. Um, if you're a linebacker, you should so show a block to feed in the box, uh, sideline to sideline ability, pass drop, show the, the variety in those top 10. Show the draw dropping clips first. The ones that are like, this guy's a can't miss. Make yourself a can't miss. Quick edits. Do not have the huddle. Don't have the break of the huddle. Have the shot. Circle who you are. Get to the action. Quickly get off the action. Like you want to go rapid pace. Do not have coaches sitting around. Most recruiters will not watch beyond clip 10. Final thoughts. Keep it short and diverse. You're, you're really pushing the attention level after 10 clips. I would even say this is why I would argue you put your 10 best clips Send a wide net and listen for feedback. Um, and act, put that right there. Ask for feedback. Send your film to opposing coaches. Send your film to anybody who can watch it and give you any type of feedback. Obviously, this should start with your position coach, then your head coach or coordinator, and move on from there. And then one thing I, I, I don't think it's brought up enough, show your top 10 wow plays that show you winning. If a DB falls down and you catch a fade route, it's not a highlight for you, probably. If a uh, if you're dominating the JV call up over and over in one film, it's probably not a highlight. Maybe it's all you have and then you have to use it. But you want to show maybe where the play broke down. I've had college coaches tell us uh, we want to see this kid, what he does when the play doesn't work. They're, they're more interested in that, to be honest. Ah. The controversy, recruiting services. All right, let's talk about recruiting services. Let's get on the table. Paying recruiting services can be wasteful. I know somebody out there already paid the 700 for NCSA, maybe the 2000. I got you. I understand. It, it, here's the deal. The NCSA website is awesome. I love it. Okay, I'm going to be straight honest. Like, this is, it's a great website for resources, NCSA. But in the 14 years at West, and this is just my personal experience. And I'm sure there are coaches out there that have different experiences. Zero athletes were successfully placed by NCSA. They were, they were placed because of relationships started by the athlete and, and relationships that were uh, deepened by the athlete and then helped out by the coaches and the parents and the staff and the accounts, not NCSA. Okay. You will get on a list They're, They will make a list. No parent out there should have to pay to get their son recruited beyond that of travel to camps, $700 for NCSA or whatever it might be, would be much better spent planning out a trip, the senior or the, the going into the senior year, even the junior year, just going to camps. It'd be much more beneficial. So when people come to me about NCSA, um, uh, it, it's it's a sensitive thing because our oh, we love our children. We want to do everything we can. And th- some recruiting services use the heart. They use the heart and they, they say, now it's not all bad. And if you still feel lost after tonight, and if after you, you still feel lost after you talk to your head coach or you call, uh, call myself or coach Harmon or, or coach Brantley or coach Hollard or anybody, any coach, if you still feel lost, a recruiting service, can offer you some more guidance. You shouldn't have to pay for this information and this work. Uh, it, it, they really aren't. They're, it's not like you pay and you get offers. Uh, just be really clear up front. That's not what happens. So let's talk about levels of play and what an offer actually is. At Division One FBS, there are 85 full scholarships. That means you're in. You, you, yeah, 
That's a that's a big time deal. This is the million dollar NIL deals. This is the play on on Saturdays. This is ESPN. Division one FCS is just one tiny step below that. And in fact, the top FCS schools are not only just competitive against the bottom FBS, they can straight beat half of the FBS teams, those North Dakota teams, those South Dakota state teams, they are very, very good football and routinely beat James Madison. Those are really, really good football teams, very similar in scholarship structure and in uh, importance for the communities. They, they make some money. And so they're going to be very, very selective on who they talk to division two, a level that is often attained by Alaskan athletes offer 36 full scholarships, although they very rarely actually give a full scholarship. Most of the time, Division II is going to be divided amongst those 36 full. The Division I FBS and FCS cannot split their offers. If you get offered at an FBS or an FCS school, you're getting your school paid for. If you're getting offered a Division II, you need to now use the head, <laughs> not necessarily the heart, and look at the offer sheet. What are they offering? Division three doesn't have athletic scholarships. It's based on academics and needs based. Um, however, they will help out athletes with this. I know of athletes who have gone to division three schools and received academic scholarships that um, very clearly were, were getting academic scholarships and being considered because they were good at football. There you go. I said it. Uh, and then NAIA, very similar yeah, to the NCAA, but a different organization and a different whole structure. It's more school-based. It's what you did academically. Um, it's going to be, they have these 24 full that they can divide, but you also have needs-based, you have academic. So they're kind of on their own thing. The NAIA can kind of do what they want. If they want you, they're going to find a way to get a chunk of your pay, uh, your college paid for. I see NAIA very similar to division two. They're very connected in my head as far as scholarship structuring goes juco mostly pay to play and a lot of us have the d1 or bus dream um and let's get into that recruiting fact check consistent direct personal messages and texts and phone calls indicate recruitment mailers and generic camp invites don't so let's think about this i need a phone call from a coach or a text or a dm to know i'm being recruited here's the timeline Really, it's your junior year or earlier if you're D1 FBS. If you've not been talked to yet by an FBS school, more than likely they're not recruiting you. Um, this is important information. It gives an indication. This does not mean to not send out DMs and texts to any D1 contacts you have. You absolutely should. Um, they might even give you fantastic feedback about where you stack up, whether you're one of theirs, or they'll give you some guidance on who to uh, pursue for the level of play you believe you're at. FCS, they're going to be, they're going to know who you are your junior year. These are going to be very, very similar again in nature, be it FBS and FCS um, as far as the schools go there. D2 will start really into the, the, the junior year. You'll see them at camps. Um, but many of our D2 scholarship athletes that we've sent out to a lot from Alaska, um, I can think of actually right now, Western New Mexico. Uh, Western New Mexico has at least four Alaskans in program right now. And all four of those Alaskans, to my knowledge, did not have a relationship with Western New Mexico prior to their senior year. Eastern um, New Mexico has a few Alaska athletes on it. And the same exact thing, minimal amount of. So if you don't have an offer on the table right now and you believe yourself to be a, a collegiate athlete, the D2s. And, and the NAIs and these guys, you're not too late on these. FBS and FCS, if you have not been in contact with them, they're not recruiting you. Just as what it is. You're, you're probably not sending huddle film out because they have to think, FCS and FBS have to think regionally. And they have to be very, very careful about selecting an Alaskan kid when there's a kid in Eugene, when there's a kid in Seattle who is equal to you equal and regional is going to win at the FBS and FCS level. And division two has, they'll take more chances on our, our athletes um, and find a really good package for them for school. D3 is similar. D3 is a lot of students that go D3 will choose to do that their senior year. Um, NAIA, very similar as well. Although with the D3 and the dues and the NAIs that come to Alaska, 
There's some there's some really good relationships that begin the junior year. This is just when you're going to actually get phone calls and texts. You can kind of it kind of gets into this timeline. It just gives you an indication of where you're at. Juco, I would recommend there's a lot of Juco offers. We're going to talk about what an offer is in a second. Juco is for after signing day. Uh, you see if you if an offer comes out, I would even say maybe push it beyond signing day. The goal is to find an offer uh, really at a four year. Uh, there are some wonderful JUCOs and some amazing men who I call friends that coach at the JUCO level. Um, and I, I would say that th- th- it's just a different set of rules that they, they have to play by, which changes what it means to get offered. And here is kind of the rub. Who's buying your lunch next year? Uh, is it the school? Is it the parents? Are you buying your lunch? Um, if you're going to a D2 school, and D3s, uh, NAIs, D, D1s, obviously, there's meal plans. You're, you're probably going to get fed. There's Someone's going to find a way to get you fed. If you go JUCO, not 100%, but the common rule is you're buying your lunch. You're buying, you're putting a roof over your home or your head. Um, there are some JUCOs that have dorms. I would be attracted if you go to the JUCO level and you're really pursuing that. Do your research, find out what JUCOs have dorms slash affordable housing that you can get into. The Cali JUCOs we send off to, I mean, hey, I love California. I I would, I I love California. I can't afford California. Can't even come close. It's so expensive. Uh, And so who's buying my lunch in California? Let's just say this, a sandwich in California is a little bit more expensive than the sandwich in wherever, okay? Uh, California prices are, are extreme. So- if you're going Cali JC, which many of our athletes are in right now at West High School, who's buying their lunch? Um, the transfer portal has changed recruiting, okay? 100% changed recruiting. And this is one of the things to consider when it comes to the JC level. Um, in 2020, we have a roughly just under 600 uh, undergrad transfers in the portal. Moving forward into the next year, we had almost a thousand undergrad transfers in the portal. Of that, almost 1,000, 40% have not found a new school, are still looking or transferred to a non NCAA school or left the sport. That means there are qualifiers and proven quantities out there that you're going to be competing against in the portal. The portal has, has changed the game. Um, so here's what I would say Juco is an awesome place if you don't have offers or if you're academically not a qualifier i would say that is the where that is where to go no offers no qualifier and you have an opportunity for someone to buy your lunch go go to go to the juco route you we louis famasino sean duffy the two guys we started with started in the juco route however juco route has changed since the transfer portal has become so predominant. And so now schools, uh, some schools are really attacking JUCOs and there's like Western New Mexico just put out a thing. They're, they're pursuing JUCOs hard. Many D twos are now getting into the portal and looking for D one bounce backs. So it just changed the game. It's something to be aware of. It's not something to be scared of on this journey. It's just something to be aware of. So know your offer. Okay. There are so many awesome offers out there. Is it a school? I've seen offers that aren't schools. Make sure you're like, yes, division three school offered me. What do they offer? We'll get to that in a second. Division two school offered me. How much did they offer me? Division one school offered me a full ride. Boom. That's awesome. So you need to know the level. Be aware, like I said, of programs that are not schools out there. recruiting. I've seen some students get offers from academies that are not actually JUCOs. Be careful about that. I've seen that a little bit. Prep schools, a little bit different deal. That's on the East Coast mostly. Um, and it's like another year of high school. That's an available thing too. Usually you're paying for those. They're pretty expensive. What are they and can they offer? Most Cali JUCOs cannot offer scholarship. They can offer in-state tuition or free tuition for California residents. So a lot of students move to Cali. They they gray shirt their first year, they pay in-state tuition, and then they have the the free tuition or the very, very reduced because in-state, it's just living. How are you how are you paying for somewhere to put a roof over your head? That's the question you then answer. And 
that process has been super successful for our guys. So I, I know it sounds like I'm like anti Juco. I'm just simply saying, if you go to a JC, make sure you know how you're getting your lunch paid for. Have you built a relationship with the coach that offered? If a Juco offers you, that means they want you to come play for them. That's a good thing. That's awesome. But when they say they offered you, they're offering you a chance to come play for them. That's what they're offering. A D3 might be doing the same, but also say, hey, there's this academic, there's this needs-based, there we go. A D2 will have an offer sheet that breaks down exactly how much money you're getting offered. Um, and here's a really important thing about D2s. What percentage of the offer actually pays for school? So for example, we had a student get an offer for $15,000 off of a $20,000 a year school. That means that 5,000 is going to come out of pocket or, or, or be put in student loan. We also had that same student get a $20,000 offer, which seems great. It's awesome. But it was at a $40,000 a year school. So these are things to consider the price of the school you want to go to and how much they're offering you. So if you're a D2 potential athlete, when somebody says they're offering you, you need to start that process. What are they offering you? This is, that's an important question. Can be uncomfortable to ask that, right? So I think it's really important. Uh, again, loans, meals, housing, books, there's other financial considerations. So know your offer. Parents, what's your role? I have the utmost respect for Vanessa Makahaley. She is the parent all-star. Uh, I made this presentation uh, more or less bits and pieces of it a few years ago. This slide has survived the years because uh, she's had two students uh, that are that have played college football, one still playing at UNLV, Alani, um, and she was an all-star through the process. I'll read this really fast because I think it's super important. If I go back to when TJ and Alani were juniors and seniors, that's what I would tell them. This, here's what I tell myself. I, it'll be a lot of work, but if they have a desire to play college ball and they're willing to do their part on the field and in class, then I will do mine. I need to count the cost, which is mostly time. They need me to be their best advocate. My job is to see what they can't. Hold them accountable at all times, prepare them and support them, encourage them. And at times when they lose focus, I might need to remind them of the bigger picture. But if they commit to giving 100%, I will too. I'll be their publicist, schedule, counselor, manager, and most importantly, their biggest encourager. There are over a million high school football players with only 7.3% recruited the NCAA. It will require a lot of us, especially coming from Alaska. But if they want to achieve the goal and commit to working hard toward playing football at the next level, then I need to be prepared and to do all I can to help them. Parents, what a what a beautiful way to, to put it right there. The publicist, schedule, counselor, manager, that's the parent, that's the parent side of the table. Um kids and coaches and school staff, we can we can get it done. But parents, they're such a vital role in communication. So communicate with your child, communicate with us as coaches, communicate with the college, get the coaches numbers, talk to these coaches, know what schools your kids interested in, know their academic standings, know the distance and living cost, who's paying for the lunch. And then keep your child focused and grounded in reality. Uh, this is a really important thing. There's a lot of people that speak to the heart Sometimes they 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 mean it and they're they have the best intentions, but maybe they're a little, a little misled about some of the process. It's really important that we help keep our kids grounded in reality. What's affordable? Uh, parents help with the FAFSA. Get those filled out. That's an important parent role. Uh, in if possible, get your kids to the schools. Visit the schools with them if possible. Ensure your child is signed up for SAT, ACT. Openly communicate. Express any issues or concern. The coach's role. What is our role as coaches? Again, it's an ownership thing. We all have a role to own. We need to help identify potential athletes. We need to guide students through the process with honesty and care. So hard. It's so hard, right? Because we have to tell kids, hey, coach, I don't got any offers. I don't got any offers. And we have to be the encourager and say, like, well, here's what we should be looking at and doing. Going through the checklist, going through the huddle, going through connections and contacts that have been established in the state. Because there's plays, places for these kids to go. Contact colleges about their athletes, work with the counseling department to secure those stuff. Uh, coaches, we're so vital that we're working with our counseling department. I've messed this up. I'm coming to you as someone who didn't didn't know what he didn't know. And we had players leave West without the right amount of credits. That's that's 100 percent on us as coaches and my me um, evaluate and help edit the players highlight film. Coach, this could be a position coach, a coordinator. Again, as many eyes on that film as possible is the best. 
honor, offer that honest assessment, serve as a middleman between player and college. I, the higher the level gets and the more the coaches have turnover, the more the trust has to be confirmed and established. You know, there's a lot of coaches that recruit Alaska and those coaches have been in their schools for 20, 20 years coaching at their schools. That's awesome. You have a pretty good idea that that guy's or his staff is going to be around that, that building for a while. Um, protect players from predatory recruiting. What does that mean? If I'm throwing it out, you're offered. Hey, you're offered. What are they offering? That's such a hard thing. Celebrate the fact that a school wants you, but have a real conversation that says, well, they're offering for you to come down and pay X amount of money to their university. Um, log college contact. Be writing, ask your players to check in. Not like, not like wildly, but like you should have a good idea if, if a school has been talking to the kids or not, rather than just a vague notion. Here's the last uh, we're coming down to the last few minutes of the presentation. The here's the big question is, do you want it? And we've thrown out some challenges and we've thrown out some, some hard data and it's not meant to be discouraging. It's meant to be the brain side of the, the heart and the mind connection to this recruiting experience so that we're not wasting our time, energies, and efforts. So what can a high school or a college, what can a freshman in college expect? I think that's it is you got to flip a switch. You know, you got to understand that you are starting at the bottom and that in a lot of cases, you're, you're a red shirt. You're not even a freshman yet. You know, you're lower than a freshman. Uh, you don't, you don't travel. Uh, you're not there on pregame. you you have the extra lifts in the morning, the extra study hall. Um, there's a lot more things in place for you. I think the biggest thing is to be patient. They have to understand that just because there's two or three guys ahead of me doesn't mean that they don't have a plan for me because they do. If they can just persevere, they'll play. If they'll just last, they'll play. Jackson, uh, in particular, his day starts around 6.30. Uh, he is heading across the street to get to uh, the facility so he can start working on his um, recovery. So, uh, you know, as a guy who's been kind of nicked up uh, so far throughout his career, he has to start with his uh, treatment. And then usually for him, I think his uh, in class ahead of field work, and yeah, that's like 7 to 30. And those guys usually on the field for a couple hours, they come back, they eat, they uh, take care of more uh, recovery and fitness stuff. Jackson's off to class by 1130. And usually that's going to run Monday through Friday till about 430 ish. And then these guys are back in practice for film. Uh, work, dinner, uh, one-on-ones, and uh, usually his day wraps up around 8 o'clock, 8.30. Because everybody's elite, and they're all used to playing both ways and every snap for their team. And um, so now you're in a situation where you got 100 dudes, and there's 11 spots or 22 spots or however you want to look at it, and you got to go out there and really compete and earn it. And, you know, when you get down there and you're not playing right away, that really wears on some kids. And we see a lot of kids that – go down they're somewhere for a semester and then they're right back home um because they just weren't mentally prepared for kind of the grind that was going to exist there it, it's such an awesome experience you know having uh having been fortunate enough to not only do it myself but um also have a child that uh has gone on and, and is doing well and has been successful um i wouldn't trade it it's such an awesome experience and if you have if if the if mom and dad and and God gifted you with the ability to go do it, um, you, you need to do it. You will regret it forever, and you'll be telling stories of all the great stuff you you could have done uh, if if you don't go out and give it a shot. Uh, such an awesome opportunity to to play college football. If you have if you have the genetic makeup and the hard work ethic and the grades, and you put it all together, it's a special special thing. But as you go through this process, evaluate. These are questions to, to really, really answer before you dive into this thing. The fit, the where you're going, how far is it from home? Who's buying your food? Football's not easy. Will you be there if football's hard? They just said you're showing up and you're less than a freshman. You might be wearing street clothes on game days as a red shirt. In fact, most athletes do. Next is your degree. What do they offer? If there's no ball, would you still be there? 
And then how well does the school actually land the graduates? These are things that are a little bit, little bit beyond where we're thinking right now, but things that we should be made aware of right now. And then the 40 year commitment or 40 year influence that the school has on you, the 40 year commitment for a 40 year influence. What is your calling? What do you want to do? What professions interest you? And a degree opens doors. And I can't express enough I, how fortunate talking with these, these, these three coaches who all participated in collegiate athletics have worked with their kids to go there. They, they really opened up some doors for us tonight. Um, they each gave 20 minutes of their time, actually more, um, 20 minutes of their time for the full interview. Please, please go to YouTube. Uh, there's a link to it here. This sheet, again, at the end of this presentation, there'll be another link to this sheet you guys can get. Um, go watch these interviews. They're highly informative and they're authentic and real. No one's getting paid for this. No one's, we're just trying to give the best information for, for high school kids in the state of Alaska. Um, and then this is the link to the actual slideshow. You can also, we will be posting, the Coaches Association will be posting this, uh, this sheet, um, a short one page from Coach Harmon he, that he typed up. Like, it'll be like, a, it's a really, really great document that will be hosted um, on the akfootballcoaches.org website. Um, you'll have all, again, this, the, the, you, the link to this YouTube, the link to this presentation, um, and the link to coach Harmon's one sheet, uh, will be there. All right. I said one hour, seven thirty-six. feeling good.